Yes. Excellent. So I'm going to talk about Dala. You may have guessed. Um, so somebody asked me earlier if I was going to be giving my standard Dala talk, and the secret there is no standard Dala talk. <laughs> so. Right. Well, I, I expect you all to remember everything I talked about last year, and so we're going to play completely new things. There will be a quiz later. Oh no! Uh, that was not the that was not the next slide. <laughs> that that there we go. That's the next slide. Um, so our original plan was to have Dala done by the end of 2015, um, and this was driven by some strategic assumptions we had made years ago. Um, basically, we had assumed that the, the 264 fees could be raised at the beginning of 2016, and that they would make HEVC cheaper than 264 to drive adoption to the new format, the new patents. This was a pattern we'd seen in the past with MP3 and, and, and MPEG2 and so on. And yeah, that's not going to happen at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would like to extend a big thank you to, to HEVC Advance for making my life better. <laughs> Um, yes, everyone else in the industry may not be so appreciative, but um, it also appears that, that VP9 adoption is, is going much stronger than we had perhaps feared. So you had people like Microsoft now saying they're going to ship VP9, and other people like Netflix who said that, that they were going HEVC all the way are now saying, yeah, maybe we'll ship VP9 in some markets. So this is good news. Um, and there are a lot more people interested in royalty-free video these days than there were even just a year ago. So our target date of finishing by the end of 2015 doesn't seem so important. Um, but we'll talk more about what we actually plan to do later on. So when I was here last year, I thought I would do a brief refresher of what we talked about. Um, so when I was here last year, our, we didn't have any transform units or prediction units larger than 16 by 16. We didn't have support for multiple reference frames or B frames or alt reps or whatever other equivalents of those things. Um, we had talked about how frequency domain interprediction was, was broken and we didn't really have a replacement for it. Um, we didn't have any loop filters or anything along those lines and we had no intro modes in our motion search. So, you know, a bunch of features in a modern codec that you might actually want. This year, we have actually a lot of these. So, we have 32 by 32 transforms and motion compensation. Um, 64 by 64 is in progress, should hopefully land before the end of the year. Um, we just added multiple reference frame support. Um, there's still only single, each block still only refers to a single <coughs> reference, but, but we expect to have B-frames ready in the near future. Um, we still don't have a great replacement for frequency domain prediction, but we do have a relatively simple scheme that does horizontal and vertical prediction. Um, and that at least has the nice advantage of it was a lot simpler than the previous schemes we had been using, even if it doesn't give great in performance improvements. Um, but it actually worked slightly better than the stuff we had before, which tells you how great the stuff we had before was. Um, and finally, we have all kinds of loop filters now. So we have a, a bilinear loop filter and a deringing filter, both of which I will talk about later in the talk. We still have no intro modes in our motion search, um, but some experiments we've run suggest that's costing us maybe about 2% of the rate, which, so that, that kind of pushed it down on the priority list for us. Um, so we had a bunch of other major developments in the past year, um, one of which is this fixed lapping idea that I will talk about in a bunch of slides coming up. Um, so we also had simplified chroma from Luma, so if you remember we predict our, our chroma planes from the, the content of the Luma plane, and we actually like deleted almost all of that code and replaced it by just a couple of lines that did almost everything. But we still, so we still do that prediction, but it's much simpler now. Um, we got better subpill filters, so these were stolen off the design in Thor, um, and you know gave us a nice nice improvement there. Um, and we've also got some preliminary screen casting work, which is really very early and, and not actually integrated with the rest of the codec, and so I'm not going to spend any more time talking about it. But we were actually starting to work in that direction. So let's talk about fixed lapping. Um, as I'm sure you all recall. Our old lapping strategy 
we had the, the filter size that we ran, so the lapping was implemented as a pre-filter and a post-filter that run across the edges of the blocks. Um, and the, the, the old strategy, the filter size was chosen based on the smallest block that would touch an edge. So you can see up, up at the top there, we have some of these little, these small blocks that makes that whole long edge there use a small filter. And then, you know, off, off over to the left, we have only slightly larger blocks along that edge, and so we use a bigger filter. And at the very bottom, we use the biggest filter because it only touches very large blocks. Um, and so, so basically, we chose whatever, whatever the biggest filter we could use to prevent overlap. And then we chose the, the filter order to mimic what a loop filter does. So in our case, on the, the pre-filter side, so this would be the encoder side, we run all the horizontal edges first, and then we run all the vertical edges. And so on the decoder side, we undo this in the other order. So we, we unlap all of the, the vertical edges, <coughs> and then unlap all of the horizontal edges. So there were some problems with this scheme. Um, one of them is that, that this, this filter order gives you very oddly shaped basis functions. So what this image is trying to show is that we have randomly picked block sizes for a whole frame. Um, so between 4 by 4, 8 by 8, and 16 by 16. And then set some of the DC coefficients of our 16 by 16 blocks to 1. And then run the unlapping filter on all of that. And as you can see, you get some of some odd shapes. You get little things sticking off the edges of your blocks and, and other little you know, strange discontinuities. And so we could make that show up when we ran a test like this, but it, we never really saw artifacts like that when we were looking at images for that. So that, maybe this wasn't so bad. The real problem was figuring out how to decide which block size to use for all of the blocks. So in order to apply all of this lapping, you have to know what the size of all of your neighbors are to figure out what's the smallest block size on an edge. Well, so. If you're trying to make some decision on, on what, what block size to use for a particular piece of content, you can't look at what that content's going to be until you know all the other block sizes you're going to decide. So it's kind of a horrible dependency problem. And we had solved this initially by using a heuristic based on you know, trying to estimate how much ringing would be present in a given block and all that stuff, and we you know, didn't actually apply any lapping or any transforms to do that estimate. We just kind of looked at it and said, yeah, that looks like it might ring. Let's, let's use smaller blocks here, right? <coughs> and this, this worked reasonably well for still images. And then we had started doing some experiments and noticed that we could get much better performance just by biasing the decision in certain ways on, on, on inter-frames. So we said, OK, there's a problem here. We need to figure out how to solve it. Um, and so what we wanted to try to do, you know, is do some kind of explicit rate distortion optimization. So, you know, one giant dynamic programming thing, like, like other video codecs do. But if we had continued with the current lapping scheme, like, you, it's basically impossible to do that. You, you, have, you have all of these mixed dependencies, and you can't make any decision without affecting any other decision. And so you just get this combinatorial explosion that will never, never you know, be computationally feasible. So, Fixed lapping is our attempt to remove those dependencies. So we start off by, we always use eight point lapping filters. Um, so that means four pixels on either side of an edge. Um, the one exception is when we get down to four by four blocks because you don't have eight pixels, or you don't have more than four pixels on each side of the edge. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and also we always use four point lapping for chroma because of chroma subsampling. Um, that's also not true for the 444 content, but for 420 is always four point. So we also use a new filter order. So our, as I said earlier, our, our super blocks now are 32 by 32. So we filter the top and bottom edges of each super block first, and then the left and right edges of each super block. And then when we want to split a block, we filter the two interior edges. And then we can recurse down splitting each of those quadrants by filtering additional edges on the inside of those quadrants. Um, when we get all the way down to four, point, four by four blocks, we have already filtered the exterior edges using these eight point filters from, larger, from the, the larger block sizes. And then we filter the new interior edges for the four by four blocks using four point lapping. 
um, which is kind of a little bit weird because the, the eight point lapping has already touched all the pixels inside the block and then we filtered them again. So that wasn't really optimal, but, but we just went with it. We explored a few other things and this, this seemed to work best. Um, and so just this simple change gave us a pretty large increase in, in, in our metrics and a big reduction in rate. Um, so PSNR and SSIM like were double digit gains and, and the, the two visual metrics were a little bit less than that, but still pretty good improvements. Um, but it wasn't universally good. Um, so we also, you know, because we had smaller lapping, we now have more susceptibility to blocking artifacts. Um, and in particular on, on gradients and smooth regions of a frame. Um, and you say, well, it would be also because we're using smaller lapping, we might get small, we might get less ringing in your edges, right? But we actually didn't gain much on that either because our four by four blocks, which are the ones that we want to use on edges that have the least ringing, went from having eight pixel support to 12 pixel support, because like some of the edges are lapped with, with these eight point lapping filters and some of them are lapped with four point lapping filters. So we actually made the ringing slightly worse in exactly the places where we didn't want it. Um, but despite all of that, it, it, looked, it was a clear visual improvement. Um, the other important point to make here is that this was all just from like all of these gains were really just from being able to make better decisions. Like it's, it's actually just running this, this optimization. So we tried something where we made the decision using this optimization process and then actually did the encoding on the frame using the old scheme that we had before. And it was almost as good. It was like within a percent or two. Um, but almost as good wasn't actually better so we didn't bother keeping the scheme. Also because like you know, having, having a decision metric that is completely unrelated to what you're actually encoding is not a great way to do science. Like, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't understand how to improve that in the future. Um, so, in order to fix this blocking problem that I talked about, we added a, a, a deblocking filter. So, our lapping, lap transform, which didn't need a blocking filter, now has a deblocking filter. But it is not an ordinary deblocking filter. So this is what we call the bilinear loop filter. Um, and it actually, in, it filters each block one at a time and doesn't actually look at any other blocks. So instead of having some filter that goes across the block edges, we don't, we're not doing that. We're just filtering inside that block. And so all we do is we, we look at the decoded pixels at the four corners of our block and do a bilinear interpolation and then compare that to what the actual block looks like. And so if it, the actual block looks pretty close to that, you know, within within some factor of our quantization step, then we actually blend the decoded block with the bilinear filtered block. So we get make it more make it closer to what the, the just straight bilinear interpolation. And so we can compute the, the optimal linear filter gain, um, which is you know, the equation there that tells you how much you should blend. And so this is you know some strength factor alpha times your quantization step size squared divided by 12 times the variance squared and, and the 12, time, uh, 12 times the variance. So the 12 times the variance just has to do with your, the amount of quantization noise you get from quantizing with a scalar quantizer. Um, and of course, like that's not actually what we do. What we actually do is square that for reasons. <laughs> um, the reasons are basically like when, when we're not sure we want to be using the filter, then we want to make the strength less. So when the gain is closer to zero, then we make it even closer to zero. Um, and as, as you can kind of see there at the bottom, so it gets rid of most of the problem gains, and I hope that shows up because I can't really see from this angle. Um, but it doesn't quite fix all the problems, so this is kind of an extreme example. This is a one megapixel image compressed to less than five kilobytes. Um, but, but, and this is not the whole image, this is just cut out of it so that you can actually possibly see what, you know, see it from the projector. But, you know, you can see it gets rid of a large amount of the blocking artifacts. Not quite all of them at this low quality, but, but gets rid of most of them. So then we said, well, if, if eight point lapping is good, let's have even less lapping. Um, so in July, we moved to four point lapping everywhere. And I'm not actually confident that this is a good change. It makes some things better and some things worse. Um, 
the changes on metrics were much smaller. As you, you can see there on the, the one at the bottom, they actually went in the wrong direction. So we want rate, <coughs> rates to go down, but instead that made fast SSIM rate go up. Um, it does give you much less ringing, just because your, all of your, your basis functions have less support. Um, but it also preserves detail a bit less. And so we tended to add lots of detail to things, sometimes detail that wasn't even there in the beginning. Um, so this is perhaps a step in the right direction, but, but and I'm not really certain. So even though those metrics did not change by large amounts, like I think the visual change is actually pretty big. Um, so it would be helpful to get people to have feedback. If you have opinions, please tell us. Um, you know, by doing visual tests, like actually looking at images. Um, so we've done some of that ourselves, and then I don't know. Um, but then we said, okay, what happens if we get rid of, of lapping entirely? So the, the Cisco released this nice code called Thor, in which they have a bunch of IPR, including the IPR on, on the loop filter that they use. And so they contributed that to the IETF and said, well, what happened if we took, stole their loop filter and used that in place of our four-point lapping? Um, and so that also has relatively small metrics changes and relatively large visual changes, and I'm even less sure that that's a great idea, but maybe it's a good idea. Um, but it may open up interesting possibilities for, now there's a bunch of other things that we could do by using a standard loop filter um, that we couldn't do because we had lapping. And so we haven't done actually done any of those experiments yet, so I'm not gonna try to post results. Um, but this is something that you can also play around with in the current code. Um, and so, you know, just dropping that into Dala and saying that this is the direction where we go, I'm not sure this is the direction just because, you know, we have to do our own IPR review and all that wonderful stuff, but, but maybe we will wind up going this way. All right, so now let's talk about deringing. Um, you may remember this from last year, the, the paint deringing filter that we presented. Um, it makes really nice images. It was also kind of complex, and that made, that was not really the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that we didn't couldn't figure out how to send it. And so, you know, it's okay to be complex if that you can actually parallelize everything so that the actual number of operations per pixel is relatively small. But we couldn't figure out how to do that. So maybe some of you guys are smart and can figure out how to do that for us. But but we couldn't. So we started looking for some simpler alternatives, um, and one of them showed up in Thor. So they have this idea of a constrained low-pass filter, which is like a really simple filter. Um, so it just averages the, the four pixels around the current pixel X, and then you know applies a small adjustment, and it, it makes sure that it, it clamps that adjustment between one pixel step size, right? So it, you get very light adjustment to things. Um, and this actually turned out to solve a very long-standing problem that was pointed out to us, in fact, by Cisco way back at the beginning of the year, um, what we call a cloaking artifact. And so one of the fun things that we were getting with lapping was this kind of noise buildup right along block edges. Um, sort of in a standard codec, you do these, you apply your deblocking filter along the block edges and it kind of blurs everything out. With lapping, we were, we applied the, the unlapping filter you know, to, to smooth out block edges. And then at the beginning of the next frame, we would reapply the lapping filter, you know, the pre-filter, and put, put all that noise back that we just burned out. And that wouldn't have been so bad, but we do all of our computations in 12-bit in precision in the frequency domain. But we store all of our images in 8-bit precision. And when we truncated from 12-bit from down to 8-bit to, to store our reference frames back for the next frame, we amplified all the noise that we had added by a factor of 16, and then that would build up every frame. Yeah, so, so we, we couldn't figure out any way, our, you know, we've done some playing around with this, and like, we couldn't figure out any way to avoid this problem other than using 12-bit references everywhere, which you know, we thought was a great idea, but the hardware people are gonna kill us. We may still do it, by the way. Um, but, but this actually turns out to solve the same problem. So I'm not reasonably sure you can see the artifacts there. And just applying this filter makes them go away. I mean, it doesn't, 
yeah, there's still a little bit of artifacting, and this is again a, a video coded at very low quality, and I've actually also enhanced the contrast in the brightness <coughs> to make it show up on the projector. So these things would look a little bit better in real life, but but hopefully you can see that it makes a dramatic improvement. But we said, yeah, yeah, okay, that's great, that's not good enough. Like, we would like to have an actual proper ring filter, largely because we, we have a lot of ringing. So we said, okay, let's try paint deringing take two. And so this was something that we you know, have designed up front to actually be simulable. And so the first step is we try, we split the whole image up into eight by eight blocks, and we try to estimate the dominant direction in each block. And so that, that part's not that hard. Um, you just do a bunch of sums and you accumulate them in different directions, and that like, you know, you know all, all conveniently symbiotifies and that, that, that was the, you know, the same step we were doing in the previous, previous painting ring part. Like that part worked well, so we didn't change that. Um, the next part is all, all new. And so what, instead of trying to do these complicated bilinear blends between adjacent blocks and all that stuff, instead we just apply a simple filter along the direction that we have chosen for each block. And so the, the, the filter we have here is, you know, it's a seven tap filter is designed to be relatively uniform. So it's mostly twos and then a couple of threes in there to make it divisible by 16. Um, and then if a pixel differs by a certain threshold from the center pixel, then we don't add that pixel to the filter. We just use the center pixel in its place. So the idea is that we're at trying to, basically trying to average pixels that are relatively close to the pixel in each, in, in each location. Um, but the good thing is that we apply this same filter along the same direction for the whole 8 by 8 block. So everything there is in these. And we don't do any of these crazy blending weights and things that we, did, we had to do with paint deringing to avoid blocking artifacts. We just do this stuff directly. Um, then we apply a smaller filter along the orthogonal direction. And the reason for that is that if you have strong ringing, like for example in a horizontal and vertical direction, then you'll pick up, you know, if you have a strong if you have a strong vertical edge, you will get you know, ringing in the same direction as your edge. And so then when you apply the, the filter along that edge direction, it doesn't do anything to it, right? Because the, all the pixels are the same along that direction anyway. But on the orthogonal direction, then everything is very different. And so we apply this, this smaller filter in that direction. Um, we have to be very careful with how we pick a threshold there so that we don't blur out you know, actual edges. But it helps us get rid of a little bit of this, this ringing um, in the horizontal and vertical directions. And so here's an example of what it does. And I don't know how well that shows up on the projector, but, but normally looking at it, you can see quite a dramatic improvement in the, in the reduction in noise. Um, and the actual metrics changes for this are also really relatively small, but the visual changes are quite large. All right, so that was, that was most of the technical section that I wanted to cover. Let's talk about how we're actually doing overall. Um, so at the Picture Coding Symposium uh, in Australia in the middle of the year, they had a still image format challenge. And we submitted DALA because they promised to do free subjective testing for us. <laughs> Always great to have someone else doing that work. Um, so, Despite the fact that they called this a challenge, they didn't declare an overall winner, um, but they did run tests on six different images with human observers. Um, and so this is the image on the left is the one that Dala did the best on, and the image on the right is the one that Dala did the worst on. Um, and so we actually did a great job of you know, preserving the texture of, of, of this woman's skin and face and hair and all that stuff, and, and the dotted green line there at the top is us. Um, so that was good news, and you know we did a little bit less well on the, the bike image because of all the strong directional features since we don't have directional interprediction, um, and we have all these rain problems. And you will notice that image there is exactly the one that we were using to test our deringing filter now, uh, which we did not have this filter when this contest was run. So, but you can see even even with essentially the worst case for DALA, like our performance was not that bad. Um, it, was, it was still you know, 
within error bars of, of for example, BP9, and within error bars here is, is you know, not that big an achievement given how large the error bars were on your tests, but. Timothy. Yes. Remind us what BPG is, please. Uh, BPG is is basically 265 as a still image format. I can teach you graphics uh, by Fabrice. That's yes. Better. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I I'm not sh I'm not exactly certain how they set up this test. So BPG actually can use two different encoders. It can use X265 or it can use HM. And I don't know which one they ran it on for this test. Um, I do know that the the Line with the red squares that is HEVC 444 was was HM uh, with 444 chrome subsampling. It's no subsampling at all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, I'd like to show this this slide every every talk to give you some example of the the progress we've been making. So we've been tracking this since the beginning of January 2014. And we've now made our video over five times smaller than you know, one fifth the size that it was when we started tracking. So that's good news. Um, and you can follow the curves there. You know, from J January, May, June, November, etc., all 2014. Then we move into 2015, and oh wait, there's a problem. February, September, and then April. So we've we've actually regressed fast S fast SSIM since April. It's Pretty close. This is the, I guess, the dirty yellow line and the blue line there, but but it is moving in the wrong direction, and this is this is exactly the result of all these changes to use less lapping, right? So we, we get we get less ringing, but as I said before, we also have less detail preservation, and you know maybe that's the right thing to do. We're actually starting our artifacts are starting to look like, you know, actually much closer to what a regular video codex artifacts look like. Which you know, in some sense disappointing, but in another sense, it's actually possibly the right thing to do. But if we look at PSNR HVS, um, where we've had a much bigger gap to make up against HEVC, we can see that we still have strong progress, um, especially right in this this sweet spot of bit rates in the middle there, which is is you know where we expect most people to actually use the codec. Um, and so here, things are still ordered in the right direction, and. Hopefully when we land some of the features that we have upcoming, so like our 64 by 64 support and B-frame support, we'll get fast SSM moving back in the right direction too. So, um, just a few updates on, on the standardization efforts. So we managed to form the NetBC working group in the ITF this year. Um, we had a successful BOF in March and had the, the working group formed and had our first meeting by the next ITF meeting in July. Um, we've gotten new contributions from Cisco, their Thor codec, which they will talk about later. Um, and of course, we were, as you saw in the presentation, already stealing pieces of it. Um, we hope that they will steal pieces of ours too, and we'll figure out what <coughs> things work best. And the, the goal is to have one codec at the end and we're all done with this. And um, the, the idea is to have the spec finished by May 2017. Ah. <laughs> You've had that line already. Hmm? You've had that line already. Yeah, well, well that line is dead. But, but things changed, right? And so maybe things will change between now and 2017 that we can push this out to the right some more. But it will be always a moving target. Yes, as, as in software, deadlines never move left. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and the thing that changed, of course, is we now have just a few weeks old this Alliance for Open Media. So we, this is a, a thing set up by Amazon, Cisco, Google, Intel, Microsoft, um, Mozilla, and Netflix. Um, those are just the initial members. We are, we are trying to get more people to join as soon as we can figure out how to have them join. Um, and so we don't actually know how any of this is going to work yet. We haven't even had our first meeting. So your question is, like, how is the Alliance going to do X? Like, I don't know. Um, but, but the things that we want to get out of it is we needed a forum for sharing IPR research, right? So, so normally when you do a bunch of research on patents, like you can't tell anybody about them. Because if you tell anybody like that I read these patents and that I think that <coughs> XYZ does not infringe because of, of ABC, like 
if you are ever in a lawsuit down the road, you basically told the guy suing you, here's how I'm gonna defend myself. And like, that makes, that gives lawyers hives. So they never let you do that. Um, but if we have some kind of joint interest, then we can, we can share this stuff without breaking privilege so that you know, just because we, we have done this analysis, we do not have to give it to the other side if we are, are ever sued. Um, and so this is, this is something that you can't do within the normal SDO framework, so we wanted to make a forum like this to, to, to share this kind of research and sort of spread it around the industry, um, save ourselves some money. Um, and, and then Google and Microsoft called us up and said, hey, we're doing this thing, and we said, well, that sounds exactly like what we want. Thank you, you just self saved us 12 to 18 months of work setting it up. Um, so, so that's why we are there. Um, it also comes with W3 style patent commitments. So all of these companies have basically said, you can use all of our patents except for the ones that we explicitly tell you you can't use. Um, which is great, because nobody ever actually uses that, that exclusion option. Um, they mainly put it in there to, to make sure that the lawyers are okay signing it off, because lawyers don't like to sign blank checks. <laughs> um, but the, the way we've seen this play out in the actual W3C is that, that this option is almost never used unless you're Apple. <laughs> um, but, but having said all that and saying, like, I don't really know how this, this stuff is going to work, like, as, as far as Ziff and Mozilla are concerned, like, you know, we are not changing how we do Dala development. It will all still be done in the open. Like, you will be able to see everything that we do. The first time I see a patch will be the same time as the first time you see a patch. Um, and we are still going to write a spec and publish it in the ITF. So, are there any questions? Kostya. Well, if you care that much about Rinian, have you ever considered doing like uh, deja vu? Cons consider doing like what? Like a deja vu compresses uh, images. Um, Just extract the uh, edges, uh, code uh, them separately and uh, then you have a much smoother texture to code with conventional methods. Right, so so if, if you remember my talk from last year, this is this is essentially what I was not present. Oh, oh. <laughs> you should go look at my talk from last year. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this was essentially the, the paint algorithm that led into our paint deringing stuff. Um, so the idea behind paint was that we would code one DC, one one dimensional DCTs along the block edges and then use this paint algorithm to fill in the block interiors. And so painty ringing was essentially doing that same thing except not coding the edges, but, but predicting them from the decoded image and then blending it to, yeah, but to maybe, make things more edge-like. Maybe you can uh, code edges explicitly instead. Right, so, so this, is, this is exactly the thing that we tried first. Um, and the problem basically comes down to if you have things like DC coefficients, you don't want to code them twice, right? So you're coding, you're essentially, you're coding DCs because like I've coded these 1D DCTs on, on my edges and then I've interpolated, so now my, my block or whatever has a DC component to it that I'm now using as a prediction for the frame that I'm coding. But the DC basis from that prediction does not match the DC basis in my actual transform. And that small mismatch basically eats up all of your gains just because there's so many bits in DC because it's compared to everything else. And so like it makes great demo images for like, you know, sub 4K sub 4 kilobyte images for for, you know, 1 megapixel. But but when you actually try to get gains on at reasonable rates, like it might have worse. And maybe somebody else can figure out how to do it smarter than we can and, and can make that work, but we couldn't. Any other questions? Is, is there a JavaScript version? <laughs> <laughs> so if I was on my machine, I could go pull it up. Um, it actually does, there is a JavaScript version, it does not work on Macs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh uh, no, no, it, works, it should work in Chrome. Um, it should, probably should work in IE too. So I mean, it, it well, so yeah, I, IE, or I guess Edge now has, has started to land the ASM.js stuff, so it should probably actually be fast enough to use. Um, but but it does not work on Macs. Like the, the Mac problem is not even a speed problem. Like there are actual corruption in the decoded images. 
I can't tell you why. <laughs> Miscompilation. Um, well, I, I suspect the actual answer is that, that some of our bit exact decoding process relies on floating point because we haven't converted it to fixed point yet. Because we keep saying, like, we should do that really soon and then never do it. <laughs> um, Did and you pack a floating point? Really? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like, Are you sure that it's Mac and not that the new C Intel CPU with SMA? Um, I'm sure that it is Mac, and I suspect it has something to do with the way that they set up the default floating point rounding modes, but like we haven't spent any time investigating this. Um, because we, we, all the floating point will go away at some point when we get around to it. <laughs> yes, and, and if, if, if we still have corruption after we've, we've converted everything to fixed point, then, then we'll try to figure out why Macs suck. Well. Yeah, so let's say hypothetically speaking that like I'm a person and I, and I think I know a lot about codex, right? And I, I hear about AO Media. So I don't work for a big company, right? Mm -hmm. How do I contribute? And I still pay my rent and, and, and go to my kids. Like how do you guys see that working out? Right, so the, I don't know how you contribute to doing IPR research. Um, in particular because I don't know how you, you feed your kids and also pay a lawyer, right? But you um, guys have thought about that, right? I mean, you want people, maybe, maybe not, but I, I hope you want people like me to contribute to AO Media. So, yeah, so how do your lawyers see that working? Right, so, so the, the way I see it working is that we continue to run the open source project as an open source project and you can make your contributions and then we will feed them into this, this alliance thing and say, here lawyers, go tell us whether or not this works. And then if it doesn't work, then we'll try to figure out how to tell you that without like getting ourselves in court. But, but for the large part, like I don't see there being a huge problem with continuing to accept contributions from people. And if, you know, if we ever do run into IPR problems with those contributions, we'll figure out how to sort that out without, you know, causing undue stress on anyone, but but we certainly won't block taking contributions just because you don't have a lawyer telling us that your contribution is okay. Like, we'll handle that for you. Um, any work or investigation on the um, entropy coder front? Um, so there's been a little bit, right? Yeah, I read your uh, RFC about some proposals and alternative uh, stuff. So. Where do you stand? Um, so, so one of the recent things that we're actually trying out now is is a quote unquote reduced overhead version of the entropy coder we have. Um, and so, so the idea is that that we do an approximate version of arithmetic coding, and we do it so that we can avoid like doing actual divisions or anything that would be horribly horribly slow. Um, and the, the initial version we started with was within about one percent of real arithmetic coding. Um, and had all the flexibility of real arithmetic coding. So it's not like the normal approximations you see that like only work for binary alphabets and, and you know, only work with pre-generated probability distributions and all this other stuff. Um, and so we now have a new way of doing the approximation that is a little bit more accurate and a little bit more complex and I don't know what, if we've made the right trade off there. So we're still experimenting with that. Any other questions? You mentioned frequency domain intra-prediction. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little more about that? Right, so, so this, was, this was something that we, an idea we'd had very, all the way back at the beginning of the project. And, and the idea was, you know, doing intra-prediction in the time domain is basically a linear operation, right? Like you, you have a bunch of pixels along your edges and you do some extrapolation and you can write that down as just one big linear system. And I'd say, well, my transform is also just a linear operator. And so I can compose all of this and do my prediction. I can you know, predict frequency coefficients from other frequency coefficients exactly as if I was doing spatial prediction on the pixels. And then say, well, now if I had something like that, how would I do that in the lapped domain? You know, where I can't write down an exact spatial equivalent, but I can try to do similar prediction as to what I would do in the frequency domain if I didn't have that. And this works to a certain extent if you had had infinite CPU. But the problem is, is that the basically the prediction matrices are not sparse. 
And so you know, you wind up with, with one, a huge training problem. So we, we would try to train these systems and you know, for doing 16 by 16, predicting 16 by 16 blocks from other 16 by 16 blocks was like thousands of, you know, hundreds of thousands of degrees of freedom. And so you, know, you need a few images to be able to train that without overfitting. Um, and, and even when you try to simplify that um, down to something reasonable, you know, basically it, it ate up all the gains. So like we tried basically enforcing sparsity to give you something that was computationally tractable, and then the prediction didn't work very well anymore. All right, anything else? Well, thank you for listening.